So before we get into what is exploratory data analysis, we'll talk just a little bit about uh, the vocabulary that we'll be using in this course, and also about kind of my general philosophy on course participation um, in terms of attendance uh, and so on. So in terms of vocabulary, we'll be using terms that come from several disciplines in this course. Some of the terms we'll be using are medical, some come from the field of epidemiology, others are statistical, or kind of from data science uh, as a field more generally. There will be other terms that we cover later in the course that are kind of more specific to machine learning, uh, and some that draw from computer science. The fact that I'm using terms from across several disciplines is intentional because it's meant to familiarize you with kind of interdisciplinary concepts. The fact is that if you're doing uh, data analysis, you're going to be working with people from several different disciplinary backgrounds. And so to communicate effectively, it's useful to have a good understanding of uh, the terms that uh, people from other disciplines uh, may be using. So we'll do our best to define terms that we kind of encounter during the recorded talks. But if you come across a term that I use that you're not familiar with, please feel free to reach out so that I can clarify uh, you know, what I meant by that term. Because there are definitely terms uh, from one area of uh, the course that have different meanings in different disciplines. And that's, I think, one of the challenges of being a data scientist these days is the kind of rich terminology uh, that sometimes conflicts with itself between different disciplines. So a word about participation. Um, as you've noticed already, the lectures are available online and will be made available through YouTube, uh, through a YouTube channel. You'll be expected to watch them before the lab section. Um, and I think the lectures are the kind of primary source of content for where information will be presented that you'll need to know to be able to complete the lab assignment and also the regular assignment and the group projects. Um, and although attendance and participation in the lab are strongly encouraged, lab is kind of the one place that you'll have in-person contact with the instructors, um, attendance and participation in the lab don't count towards your grade. So I wanna give you the flexibility to kind of attend uh, lab um, to the extent that it's helpful to you. But if you wanna leave early from lab or there uh, you know, are some weeks that you cannot attend due to other obligations, uh, then it's not going to count towards your grade. I really want you to be able to use your time effectively, however that is, uh, to be able to complete this course. The primary thing that I think you will get out of lab is that um, we'll be going over the lab assignments, first having you work together uh, with kind of your colleagues, and then if needed, going over some of the lab assignment questions uh, with the instructor together. So I think that can be helpful, but not everyone kind of needs that or wants that. So um, that'll be kind of up to you uh, to, to decide whether you want to uh, come to lab on a regular basis. So what is exploratory data analysis? Um, exploratory data analysis is a phrase that comes from John Tukey. Uh, John Tukey is a mathematician uh, and also has kind of uh, contributed uh, very importantly to the field of statistics. He's kind of the inventor of the Tukey test, the box plot, and also the five number summary, which is kind of a way of summarizing a column of numerical data with a series of five numbers you know, one of which uh, is the mean, but also includes the minimum and the maximum. And he had these kind of really interesting quotes that he used to define exploratory data analysis, which almost flies kind of in the face of rigorous statistical testing, which you need to do later to kind of uh, establish um, or to test hypotheses uh, once you've established them. And so here's kind of some of the phrases he uses to describe what is exploratory data analysis. So he first says that exploratory data analysis is a way to isolate patterns and features of the data uh, and to reveal these forcefully to the analyst. So the idea is, is that you know, uh, before you really are able to you know, form and test hypotheses, there's a lot that you need to do to verify you know, uh, what is in the data and what are some salient patterns that might indicate um, problems with how the data was collected or uh, 
features of the you know data collection mechanism. So it's kind of a philosophy and a way to approach the data to make sure that you find these kind of uh, key features of the data uh, intentionally. He also describes exploratory data analysis as an attitude, a state of flexibility, and a willingness to look for those things that we believe are not there, as well as those we believe to be there. So I can't count the number of times for you where we've had kind of a uh, question that we want to answer or an outcome that we want to predict. We obtain a clinical data set. We kind of start to get our hands around it and we discover uh, important patterns of missingness that suggest to us that you know there are problems with the way the data was either collected or with the way that the kind of data dictionaries have been coded so that we have to actually go back to the person who sent us the data and ask for them to verify certain aspects of the data before we can proceed with analysis. Now, you could turn kind of a blind eye to some of those things, um, but what, what may happen is that you end up reaching a conclusion that kind of uh, turns out to be not true. And so there's really a lot that you have to do upfront to make sure that the data you have is valid. And that activity kind of broadly falls into this area of exploratory data analysis. And a key thing to note is that, you know, although statistics uh, or some degree of familiarity with statistics is a advisory prerequisite for this course, exploratory data analysis generally does not need probability significant significance or confidence, uh, which are kind of some of the very important things that we do when we are testing hypotheses and statistics is to kind of assign probabilities, assign a level of statistical significance or a confidence interval. And Tukey really pushes back and says, before you get to any of that, you have to do kind of a lot of just basic checks, uh, visualize your data, analyze your data, and make sure you understand uh, kind of the bounds of your data. Uh, and so in this class, we actually won't be heavily focused on the probability uh, or the significance testing or confidence intervals kind of broadly. We're covering a lot of stuff that you need to do before you can even get to a point where you can either test a hypothesis or where you can build a predictive model. So there's kind of two schools of thought uh, when it comes to working with data. On one hand, you know, there's the scientific method where you start with a theory. That theory kind of grows into a hypothesis. Uh, you then go out in the world and start to observe things uh, and come up with a series of observations. And finally, you, uh, you know, are able to either confirm your hypothesis or you're able to kind of reject your hypothesis, uh, which means that you have to go back and potentially alter your original theory. And that form of kind of reasoning is called deductive reasoning. Exploratory data analysis uh, is a little bit reversed uh, from that kind of de careful deductive reasoning. In exploratory data analysis, you're often starting with a series of observations, um, or in this case, kind of retrospective data. That data has been collected possibly to test a hypothesis but may have been collected for reasons entirely separate from you know, the question that, uh, that you may eventually use to you know, uh, uh, evaluate on that data. And so realize that you're often starting with the kind of data set or the series of observations. And you're gonna look at that data and first try to look for kind of patterns in distributions for individual variables, patterns of distributions across variables, uh, and at this point, you uh, may come to some hypothesis. You might hypothesize that, uh, you know, there is a variable that's missing in a way that doesn't make any, you know, sense biologically. And so there's a kind of problem with the data collection or data recording mechanism. Or you might come to a hypothesis about some of the patterns that you observe between variables in your data set, which might lead you to start a, to kind of uh, uh, form a theory. And that is called inductive reasoning. Um, and so while they seem very opposite, uh, they you know, uh, serve different purposes. Inductive reasoning is usually a way to kind of form hypotheses, where you can see the hypothesis on, is kind of on the bottom end of things uh, in that flowchart. Uh, 
whereas deductive reasoning is usually a mechanism to confirm a hypothesis. Uh, and so although we may be carrying out some activities that look a lot like deductive reasoning, I want to be very clear that you know this course is focused on retrospective data analysis. And so almost by definition, some of the uh, you know activity of exploring retrospective data involves inductive reasoning. So what kind of reasoning was used by Sherlock Holmes? Um, so think about you know some of the mysteries, um, whether it's by Sherlock Holmes or other kind of mystery stories that you're familiar with. Um, and if you think about you know those mystery stories, you're often starting with a set of kind of clues. And those clues are kind of the observations. Uh, and you're seeing events that have happened and you're trying to figure out kind of why a certain event happened given a set of clues that are available to you. And so I love this quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle describing, um, you know, in, in the voice of Sherlock Holmes, describing this process. Uh, and what he says is that it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. So this is kind of a in support of inductive reasoning. Uh, and I think this more resembles what we'll be doing in this course, recognizing that at the end of the day, we usually won't have proof for anything that we've kind of established, but rather this will be a mechanism to establish hypotheses that we can then test uh, through deductive reasoning, you know, in uh, a separate data set or through a uh, clinical trial. So one thing that was very intentional in this course is that this course is not called data mining. Um, you know, for those of you coming from a more computer science background or an informatics background, you may be much more familiar with the term data mining as opposed to kind of the term data analysis. Uh, but I will say that in health oriented research, data mining has a negative connotation and it implies p-value hacking. Um, and if you haven't uh, heard of p-hacking, there is a really nice uh, XKCD comic that shows what p-hacking is uh, and which is why we don't use this kind of phrase in this course. So there is this nice comic that talks about, you know, uh, jelly beans cause acne, scientists go investigate, uh, and the scientists are busy playing Minecraft, but they decide to go ahead and investigate anyway. Um, and so they look at a retrospective data set and they establish that, in fact, there is no link between jelly beans and acne. Um, and they ran a you know statistical hypothesis test, and they came up with a p-value greater than 0 0.05, which is conventionally uh, a threshold that uh, many scientists use to establish uh, you know quote unquote statistical significance. So then they say that settles that um, you know um, we're kind of done. And then the person says, well, we heard that it's only a certain color that causes uh, you know acne. So then in the next, you know, throughout the comic, um, they kind of evaluate a series of different colors, looking at, you know, purple, brown, et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of notice in there somewhere that uh, they look at green jelly beans and they find a p-value that's less than 0.05. And then someone says, whoa. Um, and the headline at the end of the day is that green jelly beans uh, are linked to acne. Uh, and that, you know, the p-value is less than 0.05 and there's a 95% confidence that this finding is true. So the problem with this is that uh, when you test one hypothesis, you, you know, have a, a, a p-value assigned to that. But the moment you start testing multiple hypotheses, um, you can no longer use that naive threshold of 0.05, uh, you know, to establish what, what you know, we would call statistical significance. Uh, and even if you're not familiar with kind of the statistical side of things, if you're just looking at a, uh, a scatter plot and comparing relationships between variables and you've got thousands of variables, you're going to find relationships uh, where it looks like you know, one variable is highly correlated with the other variable. And yet that actually might be spurious uh, simply because you've looked at so many relationships that you're gonna find some to be there just by chance alone that if you were to look at a separate data set wouldn't be there. So. Long story short, we don't call this class data mining because 
that activity is antithetical to what we want to do in this course um, and is not what we intend uh, you know, when we're looking uh, at data sets. On the flip side, you know, when we have access to uh, big data or even to you know, very high fidelity uh, you know, small data sets, we can learn some really cool things uh, that wouldn't have been possible without that data. So uh, you may be familiar with this map uh, that I'm showing. This is actually a map uh, of the cholera epidemic that was put together by uh, John Snow. Um, and J John Snow is kind of uh, the grandfather of uh, epidemiology. And he uh, had been in London, London at the time of the cholera epidemic. And he put together this chart where he basically drew a line uh, for each case of cholera that was being reported and tried to map kind of the streets and also key landmarks uh, that might be associated with the cholera epidemic. And so the key thing that he theorized was that uh, cholera was waterborne and therefore was coming from the different water pumps uh, in, this, uh, in the city. So you'll see that, you know, he's got kind of this map with uh, these several lines and you can see some kind of peaks in certain buildings and kind of other areas without very many cases. And then he's got this kind of water pump that he's drawn. Uh, and you can see that around this particular pump, there's very few cases of cholera, if any. Uh, same thing with this pump down here and this pump down here. But as you go kind of closer to uh, uh, Broad Street in London, there's this one pump here in particular where it looks like all of the kind of cases are kind of concentrated around that pump. And so this led him to the conclusion that uh, cholera was waterborne and that this particular pump was uh, responsible. And, uh, you know, he took the uh, cover off this pump so that the pump couldn't be used. And kind of at the same time, the rate of cholera cases was kind of coming down and the epidemic kind of slowly drew to a close. And so while it's not entirely clear, I mean, Jon Snow is broadly credited with kind of uh, solving the cholera epidemic, not only the diagnosis, but actually kind of the action plan that led to the, uh, you know, the fall of the cholera epidemic by acting uh, on this pump in Broad Street in London. And as it turned out, you know, th there was a different water supply uh, for this uh, pump than for the other pumps. Uh, so I won't get into the details, but it just shows you that, you know, when you have access to data, you can reach, you know, at least form theories uh, or form hypotheses that wouldn't have otherwise been possible that can then lead you to doing deductive reasoning uh, kind of after that. So just to kind of harp on this a little bit more, in inductive reasoning, the conclusion of an inductive argument has content that goes beyond what was in its premises. So we started with this data set uh, showing the map of London. We started off with knowing where some of the cases were and where some of the landmarks were. And the conclusion that John Snow reached that the epidemic was being caused by this particular water pump is obviously not something that we could prove in this data set. It's a conclusion that goes beyond the original premise, but it is a hypothesis you otherwise wouldn't have been able to kind of even form in the absence of this data. Inductive arguments can come in different degrees of strength. So whereas with deductive reasoning, you know, if you have a theory, there's kind of a clear way to test that theory through observation and you observe and you find what you were looking for, you can establish and kind of prove uh, your theory uh, or at least some aspect of your theory. In inductive reasoning, you know, there are weak inductive arguments and there are strong inductive arguments. Uh, and so this is why not every hypothesis that you could establish from that cholera data set would be kind of equally viable. A correct inductive argument may have true premises and a false conclusion. This is just another way of saying that if you are using exploratory data analysis as a way of forming hypotheses, you might be wrong. Um, and furthermore, as you get access to more and more data, which are kind of new premises, uh, you might actually undermine your original conclusion. So this is just to say that 
a lot of what we do in exploratory data analysis, and particularly in predictive modeling, you know, we're trying to recognize the fact that um, in information that we have in one place may not always generalize. So at every step along the way, we're trying to make sure that the, you know, our findings at least have some form of internal validity, uh, recognizing that we can't necessarily uh, establish external validity. So why use inductive reasoning if you can go wrong with it? Um, so imagine that you, know, you have a 75-year-old grandmother and she's been newly diagnosed with colon cancer. She has poorly controlled diabetes and she has hypertension, which uh, is basically a way of saying that she's got chronically high uh, blood pressures. And you're kind of considering different options when you meet with the doctor. And before you even meet with the, you know, the oncologist, you've got some very basic questions. You know, will my grandmother benefit from surgery? Will she benefit from chemotherapy? What will happen to her if she chooses kind of one of those two options or if she chooses neither of them with respect to kind of her outlook on life, her life expectancy, her quality of life? And really, you know, a question related to that is where would you even look for such answers? And what you might do is you might go to the scientific literature, um, especially if you are sitting in this class uh, and you know, you're kind of familiar with how to search the primary literature, you might go out to PubMed or Google Scholar and say, let me find you know, information on colon cancer treatment. Uh, and some of that will be kind of patient facing summary material. But if you're really curious, you might kind of go into the primary literature. And you'll come across a variety of different types of things. You'll come across expert opinions that might say that you know, for patients with uh, diabetes and hypertension who have uh, you know, colon cancer, uh, we recommend against surgery or against chemotherapy uh, as an example, or you have to take the following measures in preparation for chemotherapy uh, because your you know, sugars might be elevated uh, during chemo uh, if you have underlying diabetes. You might, on the other side of it, come across randomized controlled trials or reviews that kind of try to summarize a series of randomized controlled trials. Uh, and while I think we generally agree that there are fewer and fewer biases the higher up this pyramid you go, um, and the quality of evidence is deemed to be better and better, as you get into randomized controlled trials, chances are you're going to encounter fewer and fewer people uh, in those studies who resemble uh, your grandma with respect to kind of her demographic and uh, you know, characteristics like her age, uh, but also the comorbidities that she has. For example, the fact that she has diabetes and the fact that she has uh, high blood pressure. So, you know, as you come across higher and higher quality evidence, you might uh, find, in, find uh, studies that talk about colon cancer more specifically, but not colon cancer uh, in a 75-year-old who has other medical problems. And so there's this nice quote that basically says, the reality of clinical research, however, is that in the very controls necessary to support a valid experiment lie aspects that are often artificial relative to the conditions found in actual medical practice. In other words, the closer you get to you know, clinical research, the further you get away from what actual medical practice looks like with respect to the kind of very sick patients that you encounter who simply wouldn't have been able to qualify for some of these randomized control trials. So basically there's this gap between research and reality. Um, and one area where this gap manifests is in the field of oncology, which is kind of the field of cancer medicine. And so in clinical trials of, uh, uh, in the area of oncology, participants are much younger than average cancer patients. So if you look at patients who had incident or newly diagnosed cancers in the United States, 61% of them were 65 or older. And yet if you look at uh, phase two and phase three clinical trials, which are kind of uh, randomized controlled trials uh, that are conducted to evaluate the efficacy of medications, you'll find that just under a third of such participants are 65 or older. 
So despite the fact that, you know, your grandmother is 75 and many people with newly diagnosed cancers uh, have share a lot of characteristics with your grandmother uh, with respect to demographics, they represent the minority of patients in uh, clinical trials uh, that are happening. This is also true in cardiology. Um, and so there was, uh, you know, uh, there's a registry of uh, 140,000 uh, patients across uh, 466 uh, centers where 2.8% were eligible to participate in clinical trials. And interestingly, you know, 68% were eligible but did not participate and 32% were ineligible non-participants. So in this, uh, you know, registry, the trial participants were uh, younger, they had less previous cardiovascular disease, they had a lower predicted risk of mortality, shorter hospital stays, and more frequent treatment with kind of uh, therapy that uh, would be considered to be kind of evidence-based uh, or kind of uh, like high quality therapy or high quality care. And so in essence, the people who participate in these trials, one are a minority of the actual uh, patients who are being seen in these cardiovascular centers. And yet the people in these trials are much healthier, have a lot less disease. But when we are in real practice, we're often needing to generalize the findings from those clinical trials onto patients who would have never qualified for those clinical trials in the first place. So inductive reasoning is a mechanism to help us deal with some of these literature gaps. It would really be nice to have high quality clinical trial level data on patients similar to your grandmother. But, uh, you know, using observations on other patients similar to your grandmother, you can ask some very basic questions like, how well did other 75 year old uh, women with diabetes uh, tolerate surgery or chemotherapy? What happened to those who chose palliation? And that is not necessarily a way to generalize and say that is gonna be true for all such patients. This is not deductive reasoning, but it is a way to kind of get some basic descriptive information through inductive reasoning and availability of data that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to get. So what I'm not suggesting here is that retrospective data analysis with really large data sets is better than clinical trials. It's not. Um, and one of the problems is, is that the data sets that we're often using to do these retrospective data analyses has a lot of underlying biases because of the you know, reasons it was collected and a variety of other things. So we'll revisit this topic later in this course, but I still think that inductive reasoning plays an important role, uh, important role in data analysis. And that will be kind of the uh, bulk of what we'll be covering throughout uh, at least the first half to two thirds of this course. And we'll revisit this, this idea of the biases that are present in retrospective data analysis later in this course.